Well, friends, this is Mrs. Hansen in Organic Chemistry class, picking up with our lessons from Section 4 in Chapter 1, How to Write Lewis Structures for Molecular Compounds. And I'm talking in my home office instead of uh, in front of students due to our uh, Hurricane Gordon warning. So I hope you find this valuable. Let's start by reviewing the steps used to draw Lewis dot structures for molecular compounds. I know this was taught in General Chemistry 1, but depending upon how long ago that was for you, we might have a little bit of rust to get off. The first step is to sum all of the valence electrons in the compound. Remember, the valence electrons are found by knowing what group number they're recorded in on the periodic table. We select the central atom. The central atom is never hydrogen, but it's always the least electronegative element from the ones that we're choosing from in the chemical compound. Step number three, we attach back all the other atoms to the central atom using single bonds and keep a tally of how many electrons were used. If we know how many we started with, subtract those that were used to create single bonds. Step four, we fill out the octet of all of the other outer electrons and step five, we finally fill the octet for the central atom. If you do not have enough electrons to fill the octet, that's your clue that a multiple bond is used. If you have more electrons left over after we're done subtracting, if there's more, you place them on the central atom and expand the octet. Now let's practice those skills, and I know this is a visual we went through and built nitrate, but let's do some together, and the process will talk about those rules. Let's draw the compound called methyl fluoride, CH3F. Step number one, we're going to tally how many electrons we have to start with. Carbon lives in group four, it has four valence electrons. Hydrogen lives in group one, it has one valence electron but I see three of them total in that compound, so it's going to contribute three overall. We have fluorine who lives in group seven, and it will contribute seven overall electrons. So together we have four plus three plus seven, there's 14 electrons in our structure. We have 14 dots to place, no more, no less. Second step. Select the least electronegative element, but never hydrogen, to be your central atom. Fluorine is the most electronegative, so it will never be in the center. That gives us carbon. We place carbon in the center, and we attach back all of the other atoms to the central atom using single bonds. Now, we started with 14. We've just used 2, 4, 6, 8 to create single bonds leaving a remainder of six. Now remember, hydrogen only wants to have two electrons to achieve its noble gas configuration of helium. Hydrogen forms a single bond, and it will never have dots outside of it. That leaves us to place the six electrons around fluorine to complete its octet. We have no electrons left. We have single bonds between carbon who wants eight, it has achieved its octet, and so has fluorine. Now, with your valence shell electron pair repulsion chart, which was a test-taking tool page that I asked you to print out and have ready, we can kind of practice. Let's see if I can find one here. I didn't really have one ready. I'm going to just quickly Google BS. EPR chart. And what we're able to do then is kind of just review a little bit about molecular geometry and things such as, you know, bond angles, hybridization, and so forth. Now, one of them I just pulled up. I'll just copy the image and let's see if I can just paste it here to just talk quickly. So, the image that I just pulled up here is one presentation of the Vesper chart. The basic geometry has to do with a steric number, which is just fancy for saying how many bonding pairs around the central atom. So let me move this for a moment. And we said 
in our structure of methyl fluoride, we had one central atom, and it was bonded to four different atoms. That brings us down to a number four. There are four electron domains. All four of those electron domains are bonded. So with four, four, zero, four bonded, zero unbonded, we have a tetrahedral molecular geometry. And we can see that the bond angle is 109 degrees. When we talk about the Vesper chart, this one that I pulled up is just a little bit different from the one that you printed, but it's what I'm referring to. Find that as we talk about molecular geometry. We can see that there are four electron domains. All four are bonded, zero are unbonded, giving us a tetrahedral molecular shape. Any tetrahedron would have a 109 degree bond angle. Hybridization, we talked about this in general chemistry as well, but let's talk about those hybrid orbitals. Now remember, just kind of bringing back electron configuration, carbon has six valence electrons. It would distribute its electrons in 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. The two electrons in the s orbital and there's two electrons in the p orbital. This is for an atom of carbon. We talked about hybridization in terms of knowing that carbon forms four bonds, and at this particular moment, I only see two electrons available for bonding, and I have an empty orbital. What happens is that it promotes this electron from the S promotes it into that empty orbital into the P. And we have what's referred to as a hybridized orbital of SP3 hybridized. We can now see that we have four spots. If this one is removed, we have four spots open and available for bonding. This is a covalent bond to hydrogen two more covalent bonds to hydrogen, and here would be the spot open to bond with the fluorine. Any tetrahedral molecule is sp3 hybridized. Anytime you have four domains, four electron domains around the central atom, you know that it's sp3. To review a little bit about sigma and pi bonds, that has to do with the spatial orientation of the bonds that are overlapping. We know that an S is a spherical shape. A P is an hourglass shape. Any single bond will have head-to-head -head orientation in space. I'm referring to just three dimensions. So that when these two orbitals, an S and a P, overlap, they'll do so in the same axes as the as the nucleus of the atom. So just kind of visualizing what this would look like overlapped, an sp hybridized orbital head-to-head -head in the same orientation is called a sigma bond. All single bonds are sigma. We've also learned that when we have a p overlap with another P in an axis above or below where the x-axis or where the, the nucleus of the atom is, we would refer to that as a pi bond. So if I'm overlapping orbitals, oh, those are supposed to touch, in terms of on top or below the axis of the atom, it's referred to as a pi bond. The second bond in a double bond is a pi. The second bond in a double bond is a pi bond. And if you have a triple bond, the third bond is also a pi bond. If I have a triple bond, the first is always a sigma. The second, and if there is 
A third, it's always a pi. Sigma simply means head-to-head -head overlapping in the same axes. Pi bond means that it's orientating itself above or below. So really, this is quite simple. I have one, two, three, four single bonds. Single bonds are always sigma bonds, so I have four sigmas. There are no multiple bonds, no double, no triple, so there are zero pi bonds. Let's draw another one in practice, CH3, NH2. Now, as we begin this organic journey, we know that molecules with these hydrogens in them, the way that they're arranged in the formula tell you something very specific. The reason that we didn't lump these hydrogens together is that it's giving us clues of how it's attached to the element right before its position. This is telling me the arrangement that carbon has three hydrogens attached to it. That's why it's written as CH3. Hydrogen will never be a central atom. It's always a place filler. After those three hydrogens, we see a nitrogen written. That tells me the backbone of this particular element has a carbon attached to a nitrogen. And the reason we see two H's written after the end, it's showing us the attachment order, two H's bonded to the end. So as I read this organic molecule, I can find great information about the way that they place the elements in the formula and how they're actually attached when we start drawing its structure. All right, carbon lives in group four. It has four valence electrons. Hydrogen lives in group one and I see three of them next to the carbon that they're attached to. Nitrogen lives in group five, so it has five valence electrons. It's contributing to the structure. And two more hydrogens attached to the nitrogen. So we have four plus three is seven. Seven plus five is 12. And two more is 14 total electrons. We've used one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve so far to connect in order and creating single bonds. We have two more dots to place. Do you see where it would go? Carbon has a complete octet, two, four, six, eight. Each of these hydrogens has the number of bonds it needs to create helium's configuration. It only needs one single bond. So this hydrogen is set, this hydrogen is set. But when you notice about this nitrogen, so far it has two, four, six electrons. It's missing the pair to complete its octet. I'm seeing carbon with single bonds in each direction, nitrogen with single bonds and a lone pair. Practice with me with your Vesper chart, and we'll talk about the molecular geometry at carbon first. Because we can't talk about the entire structure, we refer to the molecular geometry around a single atom at a time. Let's talk about the carbon. It has four electron domains, one, two, three, four. All four of those are bonded, zero are unbonded. You find on your Vesper chart, four, four, zero, and you'll see its molecular geometry called tetrahedral. Tetrahedral has a bond angle of 109 degrees. Let's look at the nitrogen next. Nitrogen has four domains. By domain, it can be a bond or it can be a set of lone pair of electrons. It still has four domains, but only three of those are bonded and one is now unbonded, making a polar region to that molecule. See that exposed region makes this a little bit negative compared to the positive hydrogens. That's a polar region of that molecule. On your Vesper chart, the molecular geometry of 4, 3, 1 is called trigonal pyramidal. 
I see no multiple bonds, so there's no pi bonds, but I do see one, two, three, four, five, six single bonds. Single bonds are always sigmas. Is it coming back to you? Let's draw, we'll just keep practicing. HCN, hydrogen, lives in group 1A, has one electron to contribute. Carbon has four, nitrogen has five. That gives me 10 bonds altogether. Who's the least electronegative element, but never hydrogen? And that's carbon. I draw back all the other elements to the central atom with single bonds and we've used four electrons to do so. Complete the octet of everyone but the central atom. Hydrogen is done. Do not put dots outside of hydrogen. It has just two electrons. It's all set. If we place the six remaining dots on nitrogen, we've used them up and there's zero left. Now let's look at your structure. Nitrogen has an octet. It's satisfied. Hydrogen has two electrons. It's all set. But the carbon only has four electrons. Remember, this is a shared pair of electrons. Its octet is not yet satisfied. So this is reminding us that when we run out of dots and the central atom does not yet have an octet, we need to consider a multiple bond. I have to rearrange to get carbon up to the eight electrons it needs. Well, let's take these two and make it a bond. Let's take these two and make it a bond and leave the lone pair on the nitrogen. When I count now how many total electrons surrounding carbon, I can see that it now has eight, four bonds. One of them is a triple. One of them is a single, but carbon always needs four bonds. And nitrogen also has satisfied its octet with one lone pair and a triple bond. When I think about a sigma, here's one, two. There's two sigma bonds. Remember, the first in any multiple bond is always a sigma bond, a head-to-head -head spatial orientation. And a triple bond has two more that end up to be called pi bonds, which has the spatial orientation of overlapping above and underneath the axes. The central atom, carbon, has two domains. Now remember, domains are bonds or electron pairs. Here's a domain. And even though this is a triple bond, it's still considered one domain. I don't care if it's a single, a double, or a triple bond, it's still one domain. Both of those domains are bonded, zero or unbonded. On your VSEPR chart, you'll see that it's a linear molecule with a 180 degree bond angle. It's a straight line across. Hybridization. I neglected to do that one before. Hybridization, how many total bonds do you see? How many total domains? Well, there's two. The first is always an S. The next would be a P orientation. S1, P1 acts to two domains. This is SP hybridized. We're going to keep practicing a little bit. H2CO, the least electronegative element is carbon. Let's tally how many electrons total. Two from each of the H's plus four more is six plus six from the oxygen. We have 12 dots, no more, no less. Now remember, the H's are attached to the carbon. That's why they're written next to the carbon. If I had an H attached to the oxygen, you'd see it written last after the oxygen. So what we're seeing is that we're going to connect back all of those atoms back to the central atom carbon 
all using single bonds. That's what we have so far. To do that, we used up six electrons. We have six more to go. Fill the octet of everybody but the central atom next. That tells me I have to place those six electrons on oxygen. Never put dots on a hydrogen. They're satisfied with one bond. They've become like helium. But I noticed that carbon is not yet satisfied with its octet. If I were to count the number of electrons around carbon, it's not an octet. It's only six. Since I don't have enough electrons to fill the octet of the central atom, think multiple bonds. So I'm going to redraw, and I'm going to take a pair of electrons, and instead of making them a lone pair, I'm going to create a multiple bond, leaving two sets of electron pairs on the oxygen. We have now satisfied the octet for each atom. Carbon has its four bonds that it needs. It has an octet. Oxygen has a double bond and two lone pairs. That adds to eight electrons. Two, four, six, eight. Remember, a line is a shared pair. In terms of molecular geometry, this molecule at the carbon how many electron domains do you see? Electron domains, just to remind ourselves, include lone pairs of electron and bonds. Now the bonds can be single, they can be double, or they can be triple. It still is one domain. So when I count these domains, I count one, two, three domains. Three are bonded, zero are unbonded. So you read this on your Vesper chart, three, three, zero. This is a trigonal planar molecular geometry. Trigonal planar molecular geometry. It lies flat on the table, just like a triangle would. Those are 120 degrees to create an equilateral triangle. This molecule is also polar. Notice these electrons that are exposed in this region, creating an electron density pulling this region here, leaving the hydrogens partially positive. The molecule is polar. Let's talk about HNO2. And I did so because now I'm looking at an oxy acid. An oxy acid. This means that the hydrogen is attached to an oxygen. To be an acid, this is called nitrous acid. We place the least electronegative element in the center. I'm going to give myself some more room to write, so I'm going to write and extend my page and just rewrite what I had. HNO2 is nitrous acid, and I know what you're saying, perhaps you're saying, hey, lady, this one started with an H2. Why isn't this an acid? Well, I know an upcoming lesson, it's not yet been described. This is actually an organic functional group known as an aldehyde. In chapter two, I promise that you'll recognize this functional group, C double bond O, we'll learn is called a carbonyl. We don't know that yet, but it's coming. A carbonyl is a carbon with a double bond to an oxygen. And if it's hydrogen on both ends, it's called formaldehyde. Have you ever heard of that term, formaldehyde? Perhaps from your bio biology class where you had some uh, specimens that were being preserved. So recognizing this functional group lets me know it's not an acid, but rather an aldehyde. And if that's uncomfortable, I'm okay there because it's coming up in Chapter 2, recognizing the functional groups. This does not have a carbon written in here. It's a nitrogen. 
this is an inorganic compound. There's no carbon at all. So I recognize it as an acid. It starts with an H, ends with an O, carbon's not in the center, it's an oxy acid, not an organic molecule. Okay, enough rambling there. I recognize it as an acid. Now, acids have protonized protons. They have an oxygen with a hydrogen on it that's released to create an acidic solution. So when I start bonding these together, the H does not go on the central atom. It's different this time. It actually will go onto the, hyd or onto the oxygen. This, by definition, is an acidic proton. It's what's released in solution to create the hydrogen ion that we measure on a system we call the pH scale. How much hydrogen ion is released comes from this proton right here. So recognizing it as an oxy acid allows me to remember that I have to attach it to an O and not the central atom. And it did not matter which one I attached it to, this particular molecule will exhibit something called resonance. All right, let's go back and count. Hydrogen has one electron, nitrogen will contribute five, each of the oxygens have six, and there's two of them. So 12 plus six, there's 18 electrons I have to place. I've used two, four, six so far. There's 12 more. Fill the octet of everybody who is not a central atom. All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two more to place, and they'll go on the central atom, nitrogen. Now, with nitrogen, it's not yet satisfied with its octet. Two, four, six electrons, and not the eight that it wants. Everybody else is set. This O, the H, this oxygen down here is all set. But we need nitrogen to gather one more pair. I'm going to move a pair of electrons from the oxygen without the hydrogen on it and form a double bond. So I'm going to select nitrogen as the center. Here's the oxy acid part. And then the double bond, leaving two lone pairs down here. Nitrogen still has a lone pair up here. We've rearranged the double bond to satisfy the octet of the central atom. Now I picked this one on purpose to remind us that oxy acids have to have a hydrogen on the oxygen and not the central atom. We could see, just kind of reviewing some other terms, the molecular geometry at the nitrogen has one, two, three, domains. Remember, a double bond still counts as one domain. A single bond is one domain. A lone pair of electrons is one domain. Of those domains, two are bonded, one is unbonded. On your VSEPR chart, you read three, two, one. It's bent. At this particular oxygen, there are four domains Two are bonded, two are unbonded. It is also bent. There was another on this page, PCL5. I'm going to go down and expand my page, and we're going to practice this one as well. PCL5. Phosphorus lives in group 5A. Chlorine lives in group 7A, and I see five of them there, so I can see a total of 40 electrons that we place. Phosphorus goes in the center. It's the least electronegative element, and I have to attach back all five chlorines. I've expanded the octet of the phosphorus 
to expand an octet, we have to have d orbitals available. Now, I'm reviewing a little bit about electron configurations when we learned the first energy level had one sublevel, an S orbital. The second energy level had two sublevels, an S and a P orbital. The third energy level has three sublevels, the S, the P, and the D sublevel. I have to be in period three or below to have available d orbitals to expand an octet. Does phosphorus live in period three or greater? Yes. If I were to write the electron configuration for phosphorus, which is number 15, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, that brings me to neon, 3s2, that's magnesium, and I go one, two, three more over to get to phosphorus, 3p3. P3, there's three open spots for bonding. Here is the 2s orbital, I'm sorry, the 3s orbital. It has two electrons in it. So right here is the valence shell. How in the world do I get five chlorines around when I have only three shells open for business? Well, we're going to expand the octet by going into the D sublevel, one, two, three, four, five spatial orientations. And I'm going to promote this to the D sublevel. Just like we did for carbon earlier, how we promoted it to an energy that was open. That D sublevels are out there and open. We hybridize to create an expanded octet. So instead of having 3s2, we're going to promote this electron out to the D orbital. So we have an S a P3, and one electron out in the D, S1, P3, 1, D1. Now I have one, two, three, four, five open orbitals for bonding. We've expanded the octet by hybridizing the P electrons. We used one, two, three, four, five. We've used 10 electrons, giving us 30 to remain. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. One, we've used 30 electrons to complete the octet of each of those chlorines. We're out of electrons we formed a compound PCl5. Around the central atom, there are five domains. All five are bonded, zero are unbonded. You'd read on your Vesper chart 550 with five sigma bonds and zero pi bonds and an SP3D hybridization. Is it coming back to you? Just incredible amount of practice makes this much easier. I'm going to share a little bit with sapling. Just, I'm not going to do every problem, but a little bit to kind of bring it in. I'm going to ask you to add electrons in the form of dots as needed. So I suggest tallying how many total dots you have and make sure that you place them all by the time you're done with this particular homework problem. Fluorine lives in group seven. Hydrogen has one. We have eight dots. Two of them are already used to make that single bond. So you can see that you'd place six more around the fluorine and complete that structure. There's two hydrogens. Each one would contribute one for a total of two. Oxygen, let me just write that to be more clear. Oxygen lives in group six. We have eight electrons. Two, four were already used. 
So I'd set two pair on the oxygen to complete its octet and so forth. So there you're just clicking to add the dots, making sure the number of electrons fill the octet of each atom that it's not yet completed. Here's a skeleton of acetic acid. Complete the structure by adding bonds as needed. So remember our lesson just a moment ago about oxy acids have a hydrogen attached to an oxygen. So there's going to be a single bond between these guys. So the first thing I would do is just create single bonds, knowing that all the atoms have to attach to each other. All right, the first one is carbon. It has four electrons. Attached to it are hydrogens. I see another carbon. I see an oxygen attached. There's two of them, one in each direction. And then one more hydrogen there at the end. So have I tallied the number of total electrons? 7, 8, 12, 12 and 12 is 24 by the time we're done. And by connecting all of these single lines in the grid paper, we've used 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. We have 10 more. Fill the octet of everyone who's not a central atom. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We've run out of electrons but I don't have enough on this central carbon. Not to the oxy acid portion, but to the oxygen that is just a single bond with six dots. Let's take a pair of those dots and form a double bond. And that way we'll satisfy the oxygen and the carbon. So if I just redraw, there's the methyl part of our functional group, CH3. C double bond O, single bond OH, this is the acidic proton attached to the oxygen. It's the one that will be released when dissolved in water to form an acidic solution. It just takes practice. I hope working these with me helps you. I'd also like to consider formal charge and how we calculate formal charge as a way to decide the best structure. Do I expand the octet? Do I keep it as a, a below? When, when do I break the rules? And it all has to do with understanding formal charge. Now, here's a molecule for carbon dioxide, CO2. And the concept of formal charge is being used here to describe why the structure of two double bonds in this particular picture is a better choice than a structure that has a single and a triple. Even though I understand symmetry rules the day, 100% of the time in nature, symmetry is followed. But I can back up my choice, other than it's a more beautiful molecule because it's symmetrical, I can back it up based on the concept of formal charge. Let's define the term formal charge. Formal charge is found by, t and it's just, it is a bookkeeping. It's kind of an abstract way for a chemist to decide, is this the best structure? And I would say formal charge can be found by taking the group number that the atom lives in. That's the number of valence electrons. And I'm going to subtract the number of assigned electrons to that particular atom and calculate the formal charge. And let's talk about what it means to be an assigned electron. I'm going to redraw those structures up here and kind of talk a little bit about assigned electrons. So let's talk about the oxygen first. Its group number is 6. It lives in group 6A. It has 6 valence electrons that it will contribute to the shell. An assigned electron are lone electrons that are not bonded. And 
half of a bonded pair. What I like to do is to take this structure and just draw a circle around the oxygen, cutting in half the bonds. Because now when I do so, inside of that circle, I see all of the assigned electrons. I can count one, two, three, four, and half of the ones that are in a bond, five, six. That oxygen has six assigned electrons. Its formal charge is now assigned a zero, and that's ideal. You want the formal charge of zero. The carbon, I take a circle and draw around the carbon, and inside of the circle, I've captured all of the assigned electrons to it. <coughs> carbon lives in group four. It has four assigned electrons. It has a formal charge of zero. That's great. This oxygen, take a circle, draw it around it. All of the assigned electrons are inside of it. It lives in group six, has six assigned electrons, formal charge of zero. So each of these atoms has a formal charge of zero that's ideal. Back to the structure that also follows the octet rule, A triple and a single scenario. Why is this one not as interesting to us? Why is it not really a, a, a contributing resonance structure? Take a circle, draw it around the atom, calculate a formal charge. Oxygen still lives in group 6A, that's its group number, and now we'll subtract the number of assigned electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, and half of the ones in a bond, there's seven. Six minus seven gives us a formal charge of negative one. This oxygen, oxygen still lives in group 6A. Six is its group number. Inside the circle I draw around it is now all of its assigned electrons. One, two, three, four, five assigned electrons. This oxygen has a formal charge of plus one. Our goal is to get rid of any formal charge if possible. If we have to have a formal charge, the negative should be on the more electronegative element. But clearly I can see by creating two double bonds, I have no formal charge, which is a better proposed structure than a structure that does have formal charge. So we use formal charge to determine the best structure for a molecule, the one with the fewest charges. And if you have to place a formal charge, always put the negative charge on the most electronegative element. Remember that's the closest to fluorine. So let's try to decide which one would give us the best choice in terms of structure. NCO negative is a compound that's drawn three different ways. What's the, the um, major contributing structure to all three of these resonance structures? Well, let's go through, and I'm going to just draw those a little bit bigger. Structure number one, three sets of electron pairs. Alrighty, so I just drew that so I can kind of have it as a scrap here. I'm going to take a circle and I'm going to draw through the bond around the first nitrogen. Remind ourselves the group number nitrogen lives in is in group five. We subtract the assigned electrons. Inside the circle I'm seeing all of the assigned electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. 7. 5 minus 7 is a negative 2 formal charge. Carbon, 1, 2, 3, 4, lives in group 4, a 0 formal charge. And oxygen lives in group 6, let's count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, assigned electrons, a formal charge of plus 1. 
we have an oxygen with a positive charge. It's the most electronegative element in this compound, and it's assigned a positive. This looks quite suspicious that it's not very good. How about back to the second structure, N double bond C, double bond O. Draw a circle. Nitrogen lives in group five. One, two, three, four, five, six. It has a formal charge of minus one. Carbon still at zero. Let's do the same for oxygen. Oxygen lives in group six. Draw a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six. Formal charge is zero. Okay, better, better than the first. Before we decide, let's do the same strategy here. Nitrogen still in group five. One, two, three, four, five assigned to it, formal charge of zero. Carbon still at zero with four bonds. Oxygen at the end, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven assigned electrons. Formal charge of minus one. I can quickly rule out the first because we have a minus two charge, a plus one charge. I'd rather have a structure where at least two of the atoms are at zero. Now my question becomes, which structure is better, choice two or choice three? And I hope if you reread this, you place the negative charge on the most electronegative element. If the most electronegative element is oxygen, and indeed it is, we place the negative formal charge on the oxygen and have the best structure. And notice this was a polyatomic ion. The formal charge will show you the charge on the ion. And indeed it did, a minus one charge overall. So that was really good practice in reminding ourselves where to place the, the negative charge. I'd like to draw at least another one with you to talk about formal charge. Let's draw a Lewis dot structure that obeys the octet rule for SO2, SO2. All right, so sulfur dioxide. Sulfur has six valence electrons, lives in group 6A. Oxygen also lives in group 6A. So we have a total of 18 electrons. The least electronegative element goes in the center, and we connect back the oxygens. Keep a tally. We have 14 more to go. Fill the octet. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Two more to place. Those will go on the central atom. Clearly, you see the sulfur has not yet met the octet rule. It does not matter which of the oxygens you take a pair from. This molecule will exhibit resonance. I can go in either direction and form a resonance structure. I'll choose to take the left pair. It doesn't matter. I take a, double or I take a pair of electrons and form a double bond back to the sulfur. Here is a structure that's obeying the octet rule. Let's show the formal charge on each of these. So the formal charge is group number minus assigned electrons. Draw a circle around the atom. Oxygen lives in group 6A. It has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons assigned to it. It's looking good. Draw a circle around this atom. Sulfur also lives in group six. One, two, three, four, five assigned electrons. It has a formal charge of plus one. How about this oxygen? Also lives in group six. Two, four, six, seven assigned electrons, I have a formal charge of minus one. I have a drawn and obeyed the octet rule, but now I'm noticing 
there's formal charges on two of the atoms. If I can expand the octet, and remember the criteria, does sulfur live in period three or below? Because I have to have a period three element in order to have d orbitals available for expansion. And the answer is yes. I can expand the octet and hybridize. So I'm going to expand the octet to alleviate the formal charge. If you can get rid of the formal charge by expanding the octet, do so and get rid of the formal charge. So let me redraw. We have a double bond here and a pair on the oxygen. So that's what we had so far, bringing what we just finished down. What can we do to alleviate the formal charge of a plus one on the center atom and a minus one on the, the right oxygen there? And that's to bring in another pair and make a second double bond. And I know when I look at the sulfur, it's breaking the octet rule but it's a beautiful thing to do so. By expanded octet, I mean now that there's two, four, six, eight, there's 10 total electrons instead of the eight to create an octet rule. But check out the formal charge when we did so. I draw a circle. Inside of that are the assigned electrons. Sulfur lives in group six, two, four, one, two, three, four, five, six assigned electrons, zero formal charge. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six minus six is zero formal charge. One, two, three, four, five, six, zero formal charge. Yay! <laughs> We've drawn a structure that broke the octet rule but we did so for a very good reason. We have formal charges of zero all the way through, and we did so by having domains of double bonds in each direction. Look at that. Our work was done correctly just to share on a clean screen what we've done with the term formal charge. I hope it's helped you when to decide to break the octet rule. And I think that we've done enough examples to kind of remind you of where do I break the octet. If I see an oxy acid, I know that the oxygens must have the hydrogens on them. Just giving, oops, sorry, just giving them you know, a skeleton, kind of reminding you that oxy acids have the hydrogens on the oxygens. That's a good start there. Thinking about octet rule and when to break formal charge as you proceed through that. Now I'm going to stop the lesson here and pick up in a moment with section six.